Hey, this is Warren Redlich. This week, Elon Musk spoke with a bunch of German CEOs and entrepreneurs. Really interesting interview that took about an hour. I'm going to cover some highlights here, including updates on where battery technology is going and how that's going to lead into electric aircraft, and also the Berlin Gigafactory progress and so much more. On top of that, I'm throwing in sexy German girls because YouTube's messing with me. And this is the best way I can know how. Plus, I like sexy German girls. And Elon's in Germany. So it all makes sense. I'd like to thank Bradford Ferguson of Halter Ferguson Financial and all my Patreon supporters for helping this channel grow. Please don't blame them for the sexy German girls. So let's start with the Gigafactory in Berlin. We just came from visiting your construction site in Greenheide. And I think it's fair to say that everybody was deeply impressed. 12 months ago, this was a forest. There yes. was no sewage. A cardboard factory, technically. A cardboard it, it, factory, well, In the sense that the, the trees were just grown for use in cardboard. So, okay. no, to be clear, not an old growth forest. It was literally a cardboard farm. Uh, that, so, uh, sometimes people wonder, are we knocking down old trees? But it's just, uh, it's actually literally a, a cardboard uh, farm. So and today... We knocked down a cardboard farm. <laughs> so, the first thing is that there's been a lot of criticism of Tesla building a factory in Berlin and criticism of environmental issues with Tesla cutting down trees. It's a tree farm where the trees are grown to produce cardboard. It's not an old growth forest. Elon wanted to dismiss that criticism. That's the kind of stuff that Tesla Q FUD is going to promote and it's not true. Elon and Tesla are environmentally cautious and careful and sensitive. Well, yeah, I mean, we have a lot of the core shell uh, that's been built and uh, there's still a tremendous amount of work to, uh, that goes on because the, the building is, is like, um, you know, like if you ever get a computer, this is the, the, the building is the box that the computer goes in, but the computer is the hard part. Elon's also minimizing the upside reporting, people talking about how fast the Berlin Gigafactory is going up. What we're seeing from Berlin and probably also from Austin, Texas, is just the shell of the factory and what goes in the factory is what's really important. So even though we're seeing the factory go up fast, there's still a long way to go. There's a lot of progress to be made. Next, Elon describes a somewhat risky strategy of how they handle permits so that they can build the German Gigafactory quicker. How, did, how do you manage to build so quickly? Well, it is, it, it is actually uh, quite difficult uh, to get all the permits and um, it requires a lot of effort and a lot of uh, a close cooperation with the authorities. So uh, it may, I would definitely not say that it is easy to get the permits, it's not, not easy. Um, one of the approaches that we did take was to proceed at risk with temporary permits. So there, there is a way to accelerate things in the system to go with temporary permits, but the risk is that the, your long-term permit could be denied, in which <clears> case that you have to stop everything. And, and tear it down. Yes. So, <laughs> so most companies are not willing to take the risk of the temporary permit, and then the risk of having to stop and tear down. Elon also explains how important speed is for a competitive business. Why, why is speed of such an essence? Well, I think the speed is um, a fundamental determinant of the competitiveness of any company. So especially with, when there's uh, technology involved. So the rate of innovation fundamentally determines which companies succeed, uh, you know, which, which companies are the number one in a, in a particular uh, arena. Uh, like unless, if, like if, if one company has twice the speed of innovation of another, uh, provided that company does not die of a self-inflicted wound or die, sort of um, have infant mortality, the, the company with the, the high rate of innovation will unequivocally win long term. That's a really important thing about Tesla. I feel like a lot of people don't understand. People who are Tesla fans get it, but a lot of people outside the Tesla community don't get it. Tesla innovates fast. No faster. No faster than that. It is very, very rapid innovation and it is laying waste to anyone who's not innovating. It is very, very important to explain why Tesla is rising and why other companies are gonna fall by the wayside. Next, we've got some big and maybe sexy news about where Giga Berlin is going in terms of vehicle production. We will aim for a half million vehicles a year. That is our goal, to get there as quickly as possible. The only uh, uh, limitation on growth is how quickly can, make, can we make cars that are uh, <clears throat> high quality, high reliability. That's the only the governing element on the rate of uh, progress. Um, but nonetheless, even with extreme effort, I think it probably takes us until 
this is just a guess that until roughly the end of uh, 22 to reach uh, that uh, level of production. So if you're not familiar with Tesla's production numbers, this is basically the question of how big will Giga Berlin get how fast? How many vehicles will Giga Berlin be able to produce and when will it be able to do it? And Elon just said that they're hoping to achieve 500,000 vehicles a year by the end of 2022. That doesn't mean they will produce 500,000 vehicles in 2022. That means that they will achieve a production rate of 500,000 vehicles by the end of 2022. So in 2023, they should be producing 500,000 vehicles or more. I believe he's referring specifically to Tesla Model Y production. Very strong chance that Tesla will also build a Model 3 factory in Europe. Maybe he means Model Y and Model 3 together in Berlin. It's very unclear what he's going for there. Seems very likely they will build a Model 3 there and they will build a Model Y there. We know they're building a Model Y there. Seems likely they will build a Model 3. Was he talking about Model Y production alone or was he talking about Model 3 production? That's not answered. My best guess is he was talking about Model 3 and Model Y. Another question here is whether Elon is engaging in Elon time predicting an achievement earlier than it's going to be achieved or is he sandbagging? A lot of people who are watching Tesla looking at what they're talking about in terms of their production method that they're going to adopt for Model Y that's probably going to go to Model 3 with the structural battery pack. That should make it easier to produce more vehicles in volume faster at lower cost. And if that's the case, I think they're aiming for a long-term, a larger amount of production out of Giga Berlin. They're already making 500,000 vehicles a year in Model 3 and Model Y in Fremont. It would not be an improvement in Tesla's production for Model 3 and Model Y in Berlin to only get to 500,000 vehicles a year. I think it's more likely that by 2023 or 2024, we're going to see Giga Berlin producing a million Model 3s and Model Ys, and that's not counting the Tesla Compact that's going to be coming and starting in 2023. Come on, stay focused, people. It's just sexy German girls. Now, seriously, coming up next, the question about demand. I love how Elon just totally dismisses this demand question. Check this out. Is demand or creation of demand an issue in your mind? Or do you, do you think no. if the car's good, if the car's workable, if it's affordable, it will be sold? Absolutely. Definitely. Yeah, no question. No doubt in your mind. Zero. Next, for me, this is always funny. Elon has often asked these questions about how does he manage his time? And he's asked about all the companies he does, Tesla, SpaceX, Neuralink, and how he dismisses the time commitment of Neuralink and the boring company quickly is fun to watch. Uh, but it's not your only company. You have SpaceX, which is, seems to be a huge success. You have your own space program. Uh, you're talking about mission to Mars. You have yes. Neuralink connecting computers to so brains. Neuralink's a small company. It's a small company. It's very small. You have the boring company building. Very small. <laughs> very small company. Yeah. Wir waren da eine Stunde drin. Eine Stunde. Und dann ist sie irgendwann ausgerastet und ist da hoch und ist einfach runter. Also hat sich da oben festgehalten. You're, you envisioned Hyperloop. It's not a company, but. Uh, well, a boring company can do the Hyperloop. Boring company can do the Hyperloop. Yeah. I, I mean, a Hyperloop is, is essentially just um, uh, a fast moving electric car in a vacuum tube. Okay, so a couple of big nuggets in there. First of all, boring company can do the Hyperloop. Elon has never really directly said before that boring company, that his company would build the Hyperloop. He really started out by saying Hyperloop was just sort of an idea and anybody could do it and other people are trying to do it. And now he's saying boring company can do the Hyperloop, which means boring company will do the Hyperloop. He also, I love how he minimizes and makes it seem so easy. Well, it's just a high-speed electric car in a vacuum tube. Okay, that's not that simple, but it's so funny that he says it as if it's like no big deal. Oh, that's easy. We'll just take care of that. Next up, Elon talks about electricity generation. He specifically refers, as usual, there's the usual talk about how important solar is, and he mentioned solar wind. He makes a specific point about how good wind is and how, much, how he's been surprised how much it's improved. I have my own little personal theory that 
if Tesla's going to come out with some kind of new innovation in the future, I wouldn't be surprised to see them come up with a windmill, some kind of wind energy generation uh, device that can be used on the home. I don't think so, especially not with what he says here, but I just think that might that could be something. And he also gives, uh, he recognizes nuclear as very effective and thinks there's a place for nuclear, which a lot of people don't talk about. I think he knows it's not popular, but he thinks there's a place for nuclear, which is also a little surprising because when Robert Zubrin of the Mars Society suggested to Elon that the Mars colony should use nuclear, Elon was pretty dismissive of that and said the Mars colony will just use solar. I wonder if he's bending on that in his own mind and he sees potential for nuclear on Mars as well. That doesn't come up here. That's just a thought. I mean, I'm, I feel quite comfortable in predicting that the vast majority of, of Earth's uh, electricity generation will be solar and electric, uh, solar and wind, I should say. So um, wind has actually been, I've been surprised just how good wind has gotten. Uh, wind power is extremely low cost. Um, in fact, a lot of the, the best wind terms are made in Germany. And one more time, Elon dismisses vehicle to grid, V2G. He keeps getting asked about it. He keeps saying no, and people keep wanting to believe somehow vehicle to grid is going to happen. It's not going to happen. Do you see the growing electronic car fleet as a buffer for that to be connected to the network, or is that unrealistic? I, I mean, I, I, just, I certainly could be wrong about this point. The early roadsters we made had vehicle to grid capability, uh, but nobody used it. So we, we, you know, it cost some money. Nobody was using it, so we turned it off. Um, we can easily turn it on back on on right now, um, and uh, actually easy, especially in Europe because of the way the uh, connectors work. A little more, we need like a maybe a hundred dollar accessory to be able to do this in the U.S. Um, but I, I really think people want to have a home-based battery. Like like I think the, the the future that I see most most likely is uh, um, solar on the roof. So either. Uh, where the roof itself, the roof uh, tiles itself are solar generating or it's, uh, solar panels retrofit on an existing roof combined with uh, a local battery. We have a product called the Powerwall. Uh, it's very popular. Um, and then you need to combine that with grid level uh, solar and wind. Next, something you don't hear Elon talk about much. I did see him tweet about it on Twitter once. High voltage electricity transmission and how that can be a very efficient way of getting electricity from where it's produced to where it's consumed. This gets into the math. Fun for math geeks. If you don't get it, don't worry about it. Probably half the people in the room didn't understand what he said, if not all of them. And then have um, a long distance uh, high voltage DC connections. Uh, high, high voltage DC is extremely uh, efficient at uh, transferring uh, ele electric power. No need for superconductors, in, in my view. Um, so, uh, like the, the 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 energy penalty for, for long distance electricity transmission is I squared R. So it's the current squared times resistance. So if you just increase the voltage, you can have the current be low, and then your I squared R heating is low. Uh, so, so you have high, high, sorry, high, high voltage, low, low current. You can transfer a uh, tremendous amount of electricity with almost no, very tiny losses. So um, now you still need to compare, to pair that, I think there's other sources like uh, hydro, uh, geothermal. Um, I'm actually uh, not against uh, nuclear. I know that uh, some people don't like nuclear, but I think actually nuclear in a situation where there's not uh, natural disasters is actually fine. Um, you know, I don't think you want to have nuclear in a place where it has lots of earthquakes or tsunamis or something like that, or, or big hurricanes with a name. Um, but uh, in places where natural disasters are not a concern, I think nuclear is very safe. That was the nuclear bit, and that's what really matters for Mars fans is, I don't think Mars has Mars quakes. There's certainly no tsunamis because there's, there's no liquid water. It seems, and there's dust storms, but, you know, they're actually, although they... You know, get played up in the movies, Mars' atmosphere is so thin that dust storms don't really have a significant impact in terms of the wind knocking something over anything like that. So there's really a case for nuclear on Mars. It's a question of whether Elon really wants to go there. From what he just said there, maybe nuclear will happen on Mars.
Elon answered a question about the impact of all these electric vehicles on the grid. And he has a pretty solid answer about how most vehicles will be charging at night and most of the demand on the grid is during the day. So it offsets. You won't need more power plants, but. Well, I think most people are going to charge their cars at home. I, uh, generally, people will charge their cars where they're charged their cell phones. Uh, and that's at home at night. Um, this actually works fairly well with the grid usage because uh, the electricity usage on the grid is mostly during the day. So um, you don't actually need a lot of new power plants uh, if, given that people primarily charge their car at night uh, at, at their house. Um, now, not everyone can do that. Some people park on the street or something, and that's where you need uh, supercharger stations or charging at work. But, but, but it, 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 total electricity power consumption obviously will increase. Um, uh, it, 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 I mean, when everything, when all transport goes electric, all road trans transport going electric, will approximately double electricity usage, um, total electricity usage. Uh, like I said, because most of it's at night, that doesn't mean a doubling of the power plants. Um, but we will need to increase uh, the amount of solar and wind, geothermal, hydro, nuclear, I think this is fine, like I said, um, in order to uh, so solve the needs of uh, electric vehicles. Um, you know, my, my guess is that the majority of the electricity production long term will be uh, photovoltaics, solar, um, and uh, paired with uh, batteries, obviously. So right there, he went back to photovoltaics at the end that it's all going to come back to photovoltaics. So solar power is the future. It goes against my theory that maybe Tesla is going to come up with some kind of wind device, or maybe it's just solar. He sees solar as being so big that even if there is significant wind, solar is just going to dwarf it. We'll see. So next, this guy asks a question that I thought could potentially have been a really good question that could have gotten a really good answer from Elon about what's the next big thing. But in the middle of the question, he threw a curveball at Elon that Elon ended up answering instead of the next big thing. So it's a little disappointing. But you also get to hear Elon's philosophy about why he does things the way he does. You have revolutionized and I think dedicated, had a dedication for electric cars. What is your next big thing you know, in your mind? You know, you called many companies sure. you are owning. What is your real, you say, this is a disruption you have in mind. Might be you don't want to talk today, but it might be interesting. No, I mean, first of all, my goal is not disruption for the sake of disruption. Yeah. Um, okay. I, I really uh, think there's, okay, there's some important things we have to solve in order for the future to be good. Yeah. I would say like my, you know, my sort of algorithm or optimization is like, okay, what set of things do we need to do uh, to ensure that the, increase the probability that the future is gonna be good? Yeah. This next answer should excite Golly from Hyperchange TV. Elon gets into electric aircraft. Listen to what he says. I'm going to talk about it a little more after he's done. Aircraft uh, will certainly go electric. Um, the uh, energy density requirement to have uh, aircraft with the uh, reasonable range is much greater than for cars or ships. So um, my back of the envelope calculations suggest that you need about 400 watt hours per kilogram to have uh, aircraft with a decent range. This is where, with a range where it's comfortably over 1,000 kilometers, mm -hmm. um, including some reserves and you know, uh, emergency power and that kind of thing. Um, and then as you go above 400 watt hours per kilogram, it gets really uh, better in a nonlinear way uh, because you spend so much of your energy getting to altitude. Once you get to altitude, uh, the air is thin and your cruise, uh, cruise, cruise power is, is quite low. Yeah. Um, so once you get, if, if you go to like 450 watt hours per kilogram, even though it's, well, let's say, 460 or 480 watt hours per kilogram, you will, you will double the range. Um, so even like a 20% increase, let's say, in energy density will double the range to at least 2,000 <coughs> kilometers, if not more. So, uh, and we're, we're getting there progressively with uh, improvements in the energy density um, almost every year. Uh, so this is just watt hours per kilogram. And... Uh, uh, a lot of the improvements in energy density actually also improve the cost because you need less material because uh, you're able to, to put more energy uh, in uh, the, the same amount of material, which means less material per, per unit of energy. Um, you know, where we are right now is um, 
you know, a little over 300 watt hours per kilogram. Mm -hmm. um, and some of the very expensive cells can do over 400 watt hours per kilogram. Uh, but the, the, the high volume cells, I think, will start to approach 400 watt hours a kilogram as well. So I, I would expect to see uh, a significant transition to um, uh, electric aircraft, uh, starting initially with propeller planes, because they're more generally more efficient per kilometer than uh, jets. Um, and, uh, and, then, and then turboprops, and then um, commercial uh, airliners and that kind of thing. Um, that transition probably happens, I think, reasonably soon. Within the next five years, we should start to see electric jets. Well, every once in a while, Elon just clobbers you with information, a ton of information in a really short time. So for starters, the biggest thing I heard there was we're already over 300 watt hours per kilogram. He hasn't said that before. Tesla's nickel cobalt aluminum battery cells that they've been making in Las Vegas have been around 260 or 270 watt hours per kilogram. A lot of us think that the lines that they're doing at Cato, the new 4680 cell will be significantly over 300 watt hours per kilogram. Elon says they're over 300 watt hours per kilogram. I think he's referring to the battery cells that they're currently making in Fremont that are the 4680 cells. I don't think he's talking about the 2170 cells that Panasonic's making or anything else that anyone's making for Tesla yet. Maybe LG Chem, but I think that's where he's going is the 4680 cells currently. And as they improve those 4680 cells, as they increase the silicon loading, as they improve cathode manufacturers, they improve other techniques, they hope to get the cells up to 400 watt hours per kilogram. And he has previously said he thinks they're going to get to 400 watt hours per kilogram in volume within three or four years. So that's not a big shocker. Another detail is he sees the transition starting with propeller planes, then turboprops, and then jets. And then at the end, he says, we should start seeing electric jets in five years. That seems like a stretch. If we're going to get to 400 watt hours per kilogram in four years and 400 watt hours per kilogram is a minimum to get that thousand mile range, I'm not sure if he means that we're going to start seeing electric propeller planes sooner than five years and electric turboprops and then we're going to get to the electric jets in five years. That seemed a little bit of Elon time to me. I think the electric jets are a little further down the road. Now, a detail you might have missed is what he was saying is, one of the biggest costs of an airplane is getting up. And that's where most of the energy usage is. Once the airplane is up at altitude, then it doesn't have that much work to do and it uses a lot less energy. And so the point is when you go from 400 watt hours per kilogram to 450 watt hours per kilogram, you use 350 watts. I'm, I'm oversimplifying here. You use 350 watt hours just to get up to altitude. And then you were using another 50 watt hours to go a thousand kilometers, 600 miles. So it's just another extra 50 watt hours to get that extra thousand kilometers or extra 600 miles in and go 1200 miles range or 2000 kilometer range. So that's an exciting, you know, what's funny, he was asked earlier what he thinks is the next big thing. And it seems like Elon thinks the next big thing is electric aviation, electric battery powered aviation. And he sees that coming within about five years, we're going to see a significant growth in electric propeller planes, turboprops, and eventually electric jets. So that's going to be exciting. He also slipped in that shipping doesn't need the high energy density. So it sounds like he thinks electric shipping is coming soon as well. I've seen little hints of it here and there. I wonder how quickly it's going to come. A lot of this depends on production of batteries. The more batteries are produced, the more this is possible. I don't know if Elon sees some massive increase in battery production that we don't see. You know, down the road, 10 years from now, we're going to see the, the 6 terawatt hours or 20 terawatt hours of battery production, and that's going to cover everything. But are we going to see this massive increase in battery production sooner than what they talked about in Battery Day coming from other producers? I'm not sure. I know we've seen some increases in production from LG Chem and CATL and Panasonic. But we're going to we're going to need to see more to see it translate into shipping, which is probably going to require a huge amount of batteries. And an interesting question that I would love to have answered is, does Elon think or do other people think that electric shipping can be done with lithium iron phosphate cells, which are much less expensive than nickel based cells? Because if you can do it with lithium iron phosphate cells, that's going to be cheap. That's a much easier conversion to make.
Last in this video, Elon goes deep on the concept of first principles thinking and how physics and thinking about things can lead to making better decisions, coming up with great innovations and just improving things. But if you haven't really listened to Elon before talk about this stuff, this is really good, really insightful and really worth hearing. And if you have heard it, it doesn't hurt to hear it again. Uh, no, first, I mean, first principles thinking is just saying, OK, what are the most fundamental truths? that we know about any given situation. Like the things that, at a very granular level, the, most, the sort of simplest building blocks um, that, that we're most convinced are true. And then, um, and then you reason up from those fundamental uh, axioms. Uh, <coughs> and then you, it's just it's sort of cogent thinking would be another way to, to refer to it as, uh, say like, are these axioms uh, believed to be, high, the, the most believed to be true? Are they the most relevant? Do they necessarily lead to a conclusion? Uh, what is the probability associated with that conclusion? Uh, the things that, because reality is really probability. It's not, it's not deterministic. It's not w one or the other. I love when he drops little bits like that. Reality isn't deterministic. It's just a bunch of probabilities. That's actually how full self-driving works. It looks at objects and it assigns ballistic probabilities to them. Where are they likely to go? And it makes judgments based on that. Elon sees the whole world that way, and it fundamentally, that's how quantum physics works, is it's not that an object is in a particular spot, it's probabilistically it's in this general area, or it's, it's likely to be here, here, or here. And when you look at the world in the future, it's not, I know the world is going to be this, it's that here's a set of probabilities that mean this is where I think the world is likely to go, or where it's likely to go close to. There's another deep bit here where Elon talks about how the internet has converted humanity from a simple multicellular organism to a more complex multicellular organism with a nervous system. Think what you want. Pretty deep stuff. I was thinking about uh, the internet and um, this is the early days and like what is the internet fundamentally? Uh, you know, it's not... It's not it's not like a place you get email or post pictures or something. Really, the internet uh, is um, like a nervous system for humanity. Uh, whereas previously, uh, communication was more like osmosis. Uh, in order for s s uh, information to travel, somebody would have to call someone with a phone or write them a letter. And then that letter would be carried by another person to, you know, by a series of people to your de to the destination. Um, now, uh, communication can ha can happen instantly from any place in the world to any anyone else, and does not need a human to carry it. Uh, this is this is sort of like you know, at a cellular level. You see, uh, say a small a primitive um, multicellular creature will just communicate via from by osmosis from one cell to the to the next, or diffusion essentially. So, um, but when, once you have a more sophisticated organism, you have a nervous system. Um, the, the, the speed at which information can travel is much faster, and the accessibility of information is fundamentally different. <clears throat> you know, if you want, now with the internet, you could be, uh, you know, in the middle of the Amazon jungle with the internet, with a satellite connection, and you have access to all the world's information. Whereas previously, even if you lived in the Library of Congress in the U.S., where the most books are, you still would only have ac access to a fraction of the world's information. This is. This is basically humanity becoming a superorganism uh, to the degree that's not possible um, unless you have uh, sort of essentially instant light, light speed communication from anywhere to anywhere as opposed to osmosis, diffusion. The, the speed of information flow and, and, and just in fact even not just speed but qualitatively the access to information was so limited before. I mean now technically you, you could teach yourself anything. Previously, say, universities had somewhat of a monopoly on uh, higher education. But now MIT has all of their lectures online. You can buy all of the textbooks. You can, you can do the tests online. Uh, you can learn anything you want. Almost, I, I, I'm not sure what you couldn't learn on, online. Um, but you can learn right now online for free more than someone who did a doctorate could do before. The, I mean, what is the purpose of universities at this point? I think it's mostly just to hang out with uh, peers. Do it! You know, let's jump. Yeah. 
Okay. <laughs> have, have some fun and uh, talk to your friends. And hanging out with peers. This Software is information. Hey, if you like this video, check out this video here about 10 industries that Elon and Tesla and SpaceX are going to destroy. Of course, check out t-shirts. My latest t-shirt. It's not about you. It's not about me either. It's about the customers. It's about the future. Please subscribe, smash the like button, and thank you for watching.